All right, well, welcome everyone uh, to this Friday talk organized by the uh, Systems Engineering uh, Staff Faculty Cultural uh, Student Cultural Competency Working Group. Um, I'm Dr. Dan Herber. Um, I don't know, many of us are in the room here. Uh, you'll be introduced to us as we go throughout this presentation titled Mapping the Landscape, How Diverse Teams Get Better Results. Uh, so quick overview, we will be doing a few things today. If the reason's not advancing, there we go. Uh, we'll have a quick community guidelines for the discussions that we're hoping to have today. Um, I'll give a very quick overview of an inclusive decision-making study that kind of is at least some evidence towards why and quantifying how more inclusive teams can make better decisions. And we've organized an activity that we will uh, kind of leverage breakout rooms both for the in-person attendees as well as the online attendees. Uh, you'll get some details on how that's going to work when we get to it. Then we have a lot of time for some discussion along this uh, kind of topic area and then some potential actions for you to do. So with that, I will let Eric, if you want to go through our guidelines. Yep, sounds good. All right, so just a few community guidelines to help frame the conversation to make sure everyone has an open mind. Oops, that's not how you do it. I don't know how to make this work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know those pcs they're complicated uh so the first one is speak your truth so try to just share from your own experiences less so you know telling other people's stories it's um more powerful to come from your own perspectives uh seek to understand uh try to actively listen to others before responding so absorb the information um before uh responding listen to what other people's perspectives are. Hopefully by the end of today, you'll see why diverse teams are important and that you should actively listen. Uh, please respect others' experiences. We may have different or similar stories to share and context to draw from all are legitimate. Uh, disagree without discord. So disagreement may occur uh, and likely is expected. We all have diverse opinions and experiences. But as this occurs, please approach unexpected ideas with curiosity, not argument. If you disagree, debate and challenge ideas. Don't attack the person that's speaking. Uh, share the air, so make room for all voices to be heard. Don't dominate the conversation. So if you're the type of person that uh, you know has a lot to say, that's great, but uh, others have some interesting points as well. So try to share the, the uh, air and just be cognizant of how much time you're speaking. Uh, for those on Zoom, please use um, the raise your hand feature in Zoom or put a question or comment in the chat. We want to hear from you and make this as inclusive as possible for online and distance. Uh, and so we think that's the best way to make sure everyone is able to communicate. Uh, and then for the in-person folks, um, try to raise your hand when you have something to say. All right. Thank you, Erica. Great. So um, before we get into the activity, um, uh, we found this, I think, very interesting study on uh, inclusive decision making that we would like to share with you. Um, so it's uh, from this kind of white paper from Clover Pop titled Hacking Diversity with Inclusive Decision Making. So uh, this organization collected data on about 600 real business decisions made by uh, a variety of different uh, business teams, almost 200 different business teams uh, uh, through you know a, a multi-year time span. And uh, the decision results were measured uh, two to three months after the fact by asking the decision maker to review the decision expectations uh, written at the time the decision was made, and then kind of reflecting and comparing those, you know, did it meet expectations, exceed expectations, or you know, not meet expectations type of thing. So it's very data-driven. You know, obviously probably within a certain space in a certain environment um, that they're making these type of decisions, but uh, some interesting results kind of come from it. So uh, one you know, key thing, you know, part of this is, um, you know, decision-making is a key driver of uh, what they measure 95% of business performance. Um, and in particular, we might be thinking about, you know, at a basic level, should we be doing things as individuals or as teams? But they found that teams made better decisions uh, than individuals 66 percent of the time with some significance, uh, you know, significance factor. The, please look at the references that we have at the end of these slides if you want to look more into the study details, as well as the kind of last slide here does have the table of results if you're interested in the numbers here. 
So continuing on what was you know, found through this study, diverse teams make better decisions up to 87% of the time. And we'll kind of see that the kind of the most diverse team as they characterized it uh, was the one that made the, the highest percentage of, of, of good decisions. Um, but diversity can increase friction. Um, I'll have some discussion points on that, um, but inclusion boost results uh, 60%. So you know, there is some challenges here in kind of realizing and you know making diverse teams work efficiently together, but sometimes I think that friction leads to you know better outcomes. It's you know questioning you know assumptions and things like that. Now, uh, kind of more specifically breaking down what was observed, gender diverse teams make better decision business decisions twenty five percent of the time, uh, but including age and geographic diversity as well, in addition to gender diversity increase that advantage to 50%. And in particular, this is you know, summarized in this graphic where you know, all male teams were making the worst percentage of decisions uh, versus again, the most kind of diverse team through both uh, for the three categories of age, gender and geographic diversity were making the best decisions in this kind of study. So, um, you know, with that kind of friction argument, I do think it's important to think about and especially, you know, individually reflect at least that's kind of you know our discussions in this working group has promoted my own internal reflection on like how can I you know promote better diversity in teams as well as be a better participant in teams. Um, so you know I like this quote because you know it, it kind of you know it, it recognizes that it is hard to change how our brains are hardwired, uh, but it is possible you know right now to change the context of decisions by architecting decision making teams for a more diverse perspective. So we just saw in that study. You know, some evidence for why we should be doing that. We're making better, uh, just, you know, the overall decisions that we're making are better when we're in participants in a more diverse kind of environment. So to make this work though, we should be thinking um, and working towards each person being comfortable actively weighing in on the decisions and uh, they're actually able to do so, to do it easily. Um, and there's, you know, lots of factors here to be kind of considering, you know, time zones, power dynamics, cultural challenges, Personality differences can all get in the way. You know, some of these are things we might value from the diversity perspective, um, and other things that we work through in terms of just ensuring that you know they are not preventing, say, someone's voice being heard, opinion being reflected in the decision making activities we might have. So we want to cultivate an atmosphere where people of different mindsets can engage uh, with one another authentically and respectively. You know, for example, you know the community guidelines we put forth uh, at the beginning. You know, that's you know, perhaps one mechanism to help promote that environment or atmosphere. Um, but, you know, thinking through just separate and novel perspectives are not only tolerated, but welcome. You know, they may be the reason why we end up with a better decision because they thought about something that we may have missed, for example. So I want you, you know, maybe to reflect on what competencies can you be building in yourself? You know, there's a couple of, uh, I think, really interesting references uh, at the end of the slide. So one of them summarizes Kind of the competencies in kind of four categories to help you both be a, a good member of, as a part of a diverse team environment as well as be a leader in it. So one is you know understanding vulnerabilities, the recognition of a flawed humanity is kind of a good starting point because then you can start building empathy, uh, compassion, engagement with others' humanity, and understanding you know uh, their vulnerabilities, things along those lines. And that can build a holistic understanding, you know, that general idea that you're kind of always aware of this complex context that we kind of live in. And then finally, oh, awesome. unconventional relationship where we help build up this environment. Uh, so with that, that was my you know quick introduction to kind of the ideas here, you know, with the study and some things maybe to be thinking about. Um, so we do have an activity planned. Um, do you know how many online, how many groups we might be having? Or if any, if you wanna, when you're ready, come up and we'll start going through uh, how we're gonna do this activity. Okay. We do two or three. Why don't we do three? I think, yeah, that three might be good. Yeah. And then I think we have probably one in-person group right now. It might be good if we want to uh, 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 congregate together uh, or at least, uh, well, we've got to have discussions between the groups. So uh, I don't know if you want to start. Sure. sure. Have you rejoined? Stop. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
All right, so um, we wanted to give the different groups an opportunity to uh, discuss what they uh, were were finding in the maps during the their own internal group discussions. Um, so I don't know if it is maybe the in-person group want to start with uh, what they have discussed. It's interesting that we went, you know, like we started with what was on the maps, but then we started to talk about other issues, like what would have created the roads to be built in those ways, like the movement between the there was a river here and some roads was built along the river because people probably had this good, right? Um, we talked a little bit about health systems and health. You know, like health systems and even how things like COVID would propagate along roads, right? That could have been even more possible. and where the water maybe was and was not. Yeah, um, I'm not sure. Could, could, could you hear online uh, what uh, Deb was describing? Uh, I'm not sure. She's a little far back in the room, but. Yes, it sounded like it was not clear. Um, if uh, you want to come a little bit closer, perhaps, so that we have the. Uh, um, Okay, we are going to uh, describe it again um, so that the audio doesn't cut out. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> so, uh, so we started by looking at the keys that were given to us, but then we kind of quickly diverged into other things. Like Jim Adams was describing how roads would have been built alongside rivers because populations would have already existed. Other roads were maybe built to join different populations that had formed. Uh, we started to talk about health systems um, because we started to weirdly talk about COVID, right? Everyone talks about COVID nowadays. And uh, you know how health systems would be better perhaps in more populated areas, but also how things like outbreaks would start in those populated areas and then spread out over the roads, that kind of thing. Um, we talked a lot about energy needs and water needs and how, you know, water maybe wasn't being produced in certain areas and would need to be shipped in. And water is a big issue with all kinds of stuff like agriculture. Those less populated zones are being used for agriculture, but, you know, like we can't steal the water from them. So I guess that's a lot of what I heard. Maybe other people have stuff to add. So what layers were you provided? Do you know what those different layers were? Oh, we seven? had something about population. We had something about age. So we talked about like, yeah, the cell phones and like cell phones might not be in rural areas, but older people in rural areas and maybe they don't use cell phones, right? <laughs> Which is kind of a bad thing for us to say. Um, and then, uh, so we had age, we had water, like rainfall, average rainfall maybe per time or minimum. Um, we had roads. What else did we have? Those are the four. Those are the four, okay, got it. Thank you. All right. I know there was a, at least one online breakout room that had some discussion. Uh, I know Kevin was it. Kevin, was there someone who was going to do a similar discussion? Yeah, if you want to take it away, Mr. Bain. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we were looking into uh, different layers. And one aspect that I think kind of obvious was uh, the built area, uh, which is the uh, left top uh, of Denver. Uh, there is no grid side. I cannot say B2 or B3 kind of thing. Uh, but if you look into uh, the noise level uh, causing from the highway, uh, that area looks pretty empty. And we relate that there is noise, therefore there's is no um, built area. Uh, another thing is um, the uh, area on the right uh, from the north, there was some uh, manufacturing, I think, or some activity causing that noise, not the highway, uh, but other activities, which is also avoiding, I think, uh, building uh, as 
a building area. It is not, uh, I don't think people are living there or uh, they built that area because there is no, no one. It is hard to say from which uh, one uh, that we can say about it. Um, and also, I think one um, other thing, I also looked into chat GPT to analyze the maps, which kind of made sense, uh, but we need more data for that. It states, uh, it sees a correlation in between uh, built area and the uh, precipitation. So meaning high precipitation rates, there are more built area. Uh, I think it is kind of borderline because, you know, there are areas which uh, is, you know, less populated. I can say no built area, but there is still precipitation, but it is just a comment from ChatGPT. Thanks. So it sounded like you had a noise layer, which I don't know, you, your group did not have a noise layer, right? Um, what, what were the other layers that you had? Uh, precipitation, uh, the land cover, and uh, I think roadmap. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think some of that, you know, the discussions were right a bit different because you did have different layers and that might have focused in on certain areas because perhaps of that perspective that that layer was providing. Um, and you do have other things you want to discuss uh, uh, as the wrangler of the maps? Yeah, sure. So, uh... Want to go to maps or? Uh, yeah, we can go to the maps. There you go. Um, so thank you everyone for participating uh, in this pretty experimental uh friday talk but i think that it it went reasonably well so we had uh several layers that everyone uh, may or may not have seen uh some of which were more useful than others so some groups got heavily correlated layers that doesn't necessarily didn't necessarily add extra information to the maps uh as they were kind of building the story right so the first layer that some groups had was transportation noise. Uh, we also, I don't know if anyone actually saw global particulate matter. Um, redlining, which matched, uh, sorry, the, there's no particular order to the layers, but we had a redlining layer to show the desirability uh, as ranked on different uh, areas within Denver. There is also the land cover uh, that looks at, you know, what is actually covering that land, if it's farmland, water, trees, or uh, like a built human area. And so that correlated highly with uh, a layer that some other groups got, which was the human footprint. So if you had both of those layers, you're not necessarily getting as much information as if you got two, two layers that were markedly different that were diverse, thank you. And so that that was one of the, the insights that we wanted to gain or wanted you all to gain from the maps is that having these diverse layers builds more information and allows you to understand more holistically what this map is telling you. Um, and then I think that's it for the layers. So we did have uh, ethnicity in the United States as a layer here, so you can see that um, Colorado is, is mostly white with Hispanic populations also fairly well defined within Denver um, that correlates somewhat with the redlining districts. If I can quickly move back to that layer, I should have put those two next to each other. <laughs> um, but yeah, so did any group find layers that were not helpful? Or that you and, didn't focus on me. Or that you didn't focus on just highways. The just highways map, yeah, that's pretty pretty easy to see from the base map, right? Where the especially in an area like Colorado, uh, the base map has pretty much all of the roads already on it. Oh, sorry, helpful except for the highways. Okay, yeah, similar similar statement. Yes, yes. Uh, did anyone have a layer that they found especially useful for developing a story from the map? or two layers that they found especially useful? Water. Water? Water and population footprint. Okay, so two, two that don't necessarily correlate, but you can get an interesting picture of where the people are and where the water, you know, usually, yes. And where the cows are. And where the cows are, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, and then 
Our other discussion questions go back. And so what was what was the most interesting conclusion or the, the conclusion that you would most like to share from your maps? People. That was a neat observation. There's no Gen X. Gen X are <laughs> <laughs> okay. Either the printer didn't have enough dark blue. That's the, possible. I did print the, them. It's not there. Well, they're all in uh, Fort Collins, right? Which yeah, you, you can't yeah. see on this map. So there's a big gap there. Why do we think that is? Like, like, and that that's not a, I don't know the answer, but, but if you had to hazard a guess, why do we think that is? Gen X was the suburb uh, generation, like moved out of cities. And yeah, I was thinking like, you know, we're kind of past that young stage where we want to live in cities, right? And now we're at that stage where we maybe want to buy houses and have families and things like that. We move back out to the suburbs where we were comfortable. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Yes, and thank you, Sinan. So there was a pretty high correlation between uh, the noise map that some of you may have seen and the built areas, right? Which makes sense. That's where all of your noise is going to be around the city. All right, so thank you, everyone. And then we have some also general discussion questions, I think. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I can, yeah, um, yeah, so we still have, you know, a good amount of time for just general discussion. So um, I, I'll, I'll pose a few of these and then, you know, feel free to raise your hand either online or in person and we can discuss. So the first one I have here is uh, what are examples uh, you have seen where a team has benefited from diversity of perspectives or experiences? If there's any kind of examples you would like to share. Well, okay, I can kick it off. Um, so, you know, one thing that I find really useful is having, you know, a lot of times, you know, especially kind of in university context, we're trying to communicate complex ideas, you know, our research and things like that. But having, you know, as a part of your team, or at least someone who's helping review the work is someone who's much less experienced with it because they really poke holes in your arguments and, in you know, your jargon heavy discussion of things that, you know, that, you know, it doesn't mean that they're, you know, that perspective of, of not seeing the work that you've been doing really can provide a lot of, uh, feed, you know, good feedback that you can't get from, you know, your direct collaborators because they're so in tune with the work that they may not be finding those same holes that I would say less, you know, familiar individuals might be. So, you know, I really value kind of that diversity of, you know, initial knowledge of the subject area that we're kind of investigating because it really can help improve the communication to a broader audience. I think adding on to that, has anyone tried to edit their own work? It's it's almost impossible to, especially if you spent a couple months on a paper, it's very difficult to edit your own work, at least in my experience. And that's where, personally, I found it very, very helpful to bring in a second and third set of eyes who have different experiences who can tell me, like Dan said, hey, um, this acronym makes absolutely no sense to people. <laughs> outside of your specific area of knowledge, uh, right. which is a good thing to know. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that's like, you know, less familiarity, but still maybe even an expert, right? Mm -hmm. Like in the space that can really be valuable because again, it's, you know, we get in our own minds, right? Of uh, how we are thinking about things and it's good to hear other feedback on that. Um, other ones, other, I can go on to, you know, with plenty of other questions. Um, yeah, I'll say the other one, but again, feel free to, you know, chime in if you have any experiences you want to share. Second one here is what types of diversity are important for teams on which you work? Uh, professional experience, strengths, educational backgrounds, social identities. I think we just described a few in what we were discussing, but are there any other areas, um, you know, general areas where you found, um, you know, having diversity of that kind of, you know, general area was was valuable in a team environment?
I'll mention the one okay. I was going to mention before. Sure. Um, sure did here is gender difference, gender diversity. Sure. I find in teams that are heavily dominated by male uh, personalities, there tends to be a competition to get it done. When you're building big, complex systems, you need a little time. You need a little deliberation. And I, when I find that there's a little bit of a female perspective added, that I don't know, it can be significant. Um, then I find the team slow down, deliberate more, get more diversity in the, in the options that are available, and then work together to bring it to, bring it to a conclusion. And in these complex systems, running fast tends to create problems. And so I always applauded meetings that when I was at Lockheed Martin, when there would be a significant number, if not a majority, of the female presence in the room. Yeah, and I'll reemphasize the you know the the case study results of you know the worst performing team was an all male team in terms of making the best decisions. So um, evidence for your claim, Jim. Yeah, <laughs> um, I probably created that statistic. <laughs> all right, I, I'll say a few more then. Um, have you observed any specific positive steps to create a more inclusive environment that you would like to share? having the DEI committees uh, for systems engineering and the College of Engineering in general is at least is at least a step in the right direction for bringing this question and this discussion to the forefront and having a Friday talk like this um, that you know emphasizes the importance of having that diverse and inclusive environment. Yes, you know, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, and you know, helping you know frame the activities is another thing that I see. You know, so again, if you attended our previous Friday talk, um, we also had those community guidelines, and I think you know, making that a part of the normal practice of you know the meetings and events and things you're holding, um, I think it's a positive step to more inclusive environments. You know, making sure that everyone is understanding kind of the environment that we're hoping to facilitate and the rules kind of around it. Um, so I think that's a positive step in terms of trying to make that a part of the normal, uh, the normal operating procedure when we're having, you know, discussions. Yeah, so I'll repeat it just so that everyone online can hear it. Yeah, um, so uh, the, the comment was about, um, you know, we, we as a systems engineering department have very regular faculty meetings, and it's not just faculty meetings, that's a misnomer, it's faculty and staff meetings. We have a lively, I think, discussion with the whole department, the whole team that makes it work. So uh, having that, you know, regular, you know, open forum, I think, does promote you know, more inclusive department environments, or at least I think that's what I was getting from your your comments there. And you know, again, you know, opening up the opportunities is 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 great for that discussion. All right, moving through. Um, are there any concerns that you have observed or thought about working in a more diverse population or community? I haven't seen a hand raised yet, but I do, I'm monitoring it. So yeah, go ahead, Jim, here. Yeah, <laughs> right here. the biggest challenge I see is when teams are forced to be diverse or just they're crashed together sure. and then expected to be in the production stage right away. It takes time, any kind of team to come together, let alone a team that has more diverse backgrounds. We gotta give them time. Yeah, and thanks for sharing, yeah, just this. Yeah, so trust, safety, uh, allow enough time, right? It, it's taking some time to get to that point. Um, that, that Those are kind of the things I was hearing. Um, yeah, any, any other, you know, online or in-person comments on any other concerns or uh, maybe concerns is more like challenges, right? Challenges we want to do work through. Yes, uh, go ahead, Dixie. Um, I think something I've seen is 
even if a team or a group of people thinks that they're not that diverse, something that gets overlooked is setting initial team expectations and boundaries and rules of conduct at the start. And then that can lead to conflict and revealing some maybe cultural differences later on as the project goes on. Yes, thanks for sharing. Good time we're at. All right. Um, okay, again, feel free to jump in if you want to revisit questions, but I'll move on to uh, the fifth one. And how do you think institutions, companies, you know, the university, the department uh, can improve the diversity and success of teams in the future? You know, any things that you observe that you might want to promote here or any kind of thoughts along those lines? And go into Jim's comment is making sure that you know organizations need to give teams time to okay. to become cohesive and learn essentially how they can work with each other before expecting any real results. Sure. Also, how can you build that? I don't know. You have to start with you know, the people and really make sure you know, that would be great if they can prepare a set out for it to be so that they can eventually the patient on their service. Okay. Right. Right. Like, yeah, the environment and the workflow processes need to be there to make that happen. Um, right. Doesn't happen overnight type of thing. Um, definitely. You know, I think having more, you know, meetings that a lot you know that is more inclusive and open for participation you know those who want to participate you need to enable that you need to make it them aware that they're happening and that they're invited and welcome and things like that so and in, in, if you know if they're if they're not aware that they can come and participate they're not going to participate and you're not going to get that kind of diverse perspective that we may want in a kind of a team environment All right, and the, the last one we have at least listed here is if an organization's leadership team is not diverse, how can more opinions and ideas be engaged? Or, uh, you know, kind of improving at least the transparency of the decision the organization, if the leadership isn't diverse, at least providing the opportunity for the broader organization to weigh in helps kind of bridge some of that gap and then at least get more opinions and ideas, but it's not ideal. Yep, and comment here is encouraging the use of motivational interviewing in dialogue and collaboration. collaboration. I mean, that leadership team has to say, we don't represent everything we want to. <laughs> we don't have that yet. So check us, right? Check on us, talk to us. Right? They, they're being vulnerable, like one of the rules we had earlier, right? And being empathetic yep, exactly. is what's going to draw in more of that, that um, I was going to say support, but not, not support, but just more information, more suggestions. <laughs> they've got to recognize it. they got to say, we're working on it, but we're not there. This, this is the leadership team you have right now. Help us. Yeah. Any other general points anyone wants to make or general questions that are covered kind of on what we have here that you want to share? All right, well, I know we're getting close to time, so maybe I will just show our last couple of slides. So um, we do have space, I believe, still on the, the student subcommittee uh, in the SC department. So if you are interested in participating and helping shape these type of talks and 
in the participating in the activities, there is kind of a, a group that you can join if you're interested. So please reach out there. Um, and we do try to keep up to date both uh, through events, resources, talks, workshops, um, our department uh, page, which also I think links to other university resources and things like that. So if you have not bookmarked that, I would encourage you to do so and check it every so often if you're looking for other events, you know, events that aren't hosted by us, but are offered say through university or other means um, to build your own competencies and things like that. Um, there's a, again, a few references, you know, the, the, the initial study that I was uh, citing in the initial part of the talk, as well as some other I think, interesting uh, papers on uh, intergroup competencies and, and some of the things we discussed here. So any other final comments or concluding thoughts? All right, well then let's wrap it up. Thank you everyone uh, for participating and engaging in this Friday talk. Um, look forward to more in the future. Thank you.